Welcome. I'm so glad that you're joining me for this pre-Pesach mini-series, which we've entitled Survivor Egypt, because Pesach is the story of our survival from Egypt. And a lot of people struggle with Pesach. There's the Pesach Seder and not necessarily having something to say. And therefore, we've decided to begin this five-part Pesach mini-series. And every day, and today's day one, I'm going to give you a bit more. Today is the history. Who built the pyramids? Are they ours? How did we get there and how did we get out? And just run you through what was going on and how the Jews got to Egypt and how we got out. In the book of Exodus, in the Torah, the Torah reports, Vayokom Melachodosh, a new king arose. And whether this is a new king or whether this is a king that actually knew Joseph but opted not to know Joseph, it says a new king arose that didn't know Joseph. Perhaps there was a revolution and there are a number of different historical incidents that took place over a period of some hundreds of years that different historians have tried to line up as to what exactly Vayokom Melachodosh actually means. Whatever it is, he made out like he didn't know who Joseph or the prior history was. And he's scared of the Jews. He's scared of the Hebrews. The Hebrews being the people from Ever Hayarden, from the other side of the Jordan. They weren't Egyptian nationals. They were foreigners. They looked different. They spoke different. One of the great moments of racism. And what he does is he hatches a plan in how he will enslave them. And you can't just suddenly enslave tens of thousands of people. Even that doesn't work. Even in old Egypt. Potentially already some hundreds, a hundred thousand people. And what he does is he comes up with a bunch of national projects. And he says, people of Egypt, we shall all build. And Pharaoh himself rolls up his sleeves and he gets involved in the building. He's into it. Everyone's into it. And slowly, over a period of years, he pulls the Egyptians off until basically just the Hebrews are working on these national projects. A lot of people like to believe that we built the pyramids. So here's myth debunking number one. The pyramids are aged somewhere closer to 4,000 plus years old. The Sphinx is aged even older. We weren't there then. We didn't build the pyramids. And even if you really wish we did, and even if you tried to twist the dates, the Torah establishes that we actually did not build anything of substance. Because the Torah says that, that Pharaoh made the people build useless storehouses and monuments that would sink into the sand. It wasn't about building Egypt. It was about enslaving us, controlling us, controlling the people so there'd be no revolution until they could work out what to do. They couldn't just kill them out. Slaves are far more valuable than corpses. And so putting them on meaningless projects, which actually is not too different from how my grandmother describes as part of her time in Auschwitz, when she used to carry rocks from one place to another, and then the next day carry the rocks back to the quarry. Meaningless work. Eventually she'd get another job in the camps. But this was far more important than killing, was keeping your slaves alive until you need them for another time. Over the next few decades, life becomes more and more bitter. The people lose all rights. They lose all rights to food, and now they live off rations. And the rations that they're given are flour, water-based rations, no different from matzah. It sits in the stomach, it blocks the system, in many ways, and it's cheap. For decades, that would be life. Let's go back a few years, to the early stages of the slavery. Once the Egyptians have been pulled off, there was an interesting miracle that took place. And for this, we salute the women. Men came home from work, and they were buggered. Women worked, but they weren't buggered. They were actually still keen to have children, to bring another generation. Men were apathetic. Why should we have children? Why shouldn't we? It's no use. We're all slaves. Why bring them into this world? The women, though, Believing an earlier prophecy that was once made to their great 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 grandfather Avram Avinu, actually, Avram, Abraham received a promise that the Jews, that the people would be taken out of Egypt one day. And holding on to this, this prophecy, holding on to this, this promise, the women begged their husbands, enticed their husbands, and they would have children. And the miracle was they wouldn't have one child, 
they would have multiple children, childbirths. They would have three, four, five, up to six children at a time, born healthy. As this took place, Pharaoh gave the instruction to start killing the children off. This is an overpopulation problem. This is, just, this is beyond just controlling slaves. We've got a population issue of slaves having more children faster than the Egyptians were having children. And he instructed that all girls be killed off, because at least the boys could be put into the workforce. The astrologers came to Pharaoh one day and said, Pharaoh, you've got a problem. Tomorrow, the saviour of the slaves is going to be born. And Pharaoh gives the instruction that every single child born should be killed. And the Egyptians go through the Jewish townships slaughtering any baby born. And they go searching for a ready-born baby to kill them. And this is how Moshe is born. Moshe's mother, Yecheved, was a very, very special woman. She and her husband had separated for many years so that they wouldn't have children and had only recently come back together. And they have this child, and they've already got other children, Aaron, who's three years older, and Miriam, who's even older than Aaron. Miriam would go on to become a prophetess in her own right, and Aaron would go on to become the high priest. But that's not for this series. They take Moshe, born on the day that the astrologers said that the saviour of the, Jew, the slaves in Egypt would be born, and out of fear, wrap him up, put him in a basket and hide him. And after some time, after a few days, tar the basket so that it becomes waterproof and floats. They place him on the Nile and it's in God's hand. Moses floats down the Nile and happens to pass very close by to where Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh, is bathing. Batya couldn't have children. And she reaches out and sees this basket and pulls it towards her. And in there is a newborn baby. And she claims it as her own and names him Moshe. And raises him in her home as a royal prince. Moshe, Moses grows up as a royal prince in Egypt. He's educated as such. And Yocheved, a woman that happens to be watching, offers... Batya to nurse, to be her, mil her milk nurse, to nurse this child. And so in the first years of Moshe's life, he's actually being nursed by not a nurse, but his mother. And this goes on for years, and Batya raises child Moshe. When Moshe was an adult, a young adult, he is now given authority within Egypt. And he travels and is respected as an Egyptian. One day, Moshe's traveling through one of the provinces of Egypt. It happens to be where the Jews are enslaved. And he's always been aware of the slaves and always has had a strong affinity. It seems that Moshe knew who he really was, but was privileged that he grew up in the house of Pharaoh. Always identified with the slaves, not with the Egyptians. And when one day he sees a slave being beaten to a point that, they are, that the slave is struggling to even breathe, Moshe intervenes and pushes the taskmaster off him, defending the slave and inadvertently killing the slave master. Word gets out that a prince of Egypt has killed an Egyptian in the name of a slave. Bit of symmetry to earlier in, in our story. And Pharaoh summons Moshe and says, what have you done? He says, you're not going to go on trial. All you have to do is apologize. Renounce your actions. We can cover it up. We can make it disappear. That's fine. You're a prince. You can kill whoever you want. But just come out and say the slaves are slaves and Egyptians are the better race. And when Moshe refuses to do that, he opts in that moment to flee. And it seems to have all been on that day that as the word spread, as a message was sent that he could, he could come back home, and he could actually be a free man, and he could just has to renounce his actions. Moshe chose not to. And the Medrash, the commentaries tell us, he immediately fled Egypt. And he fled. And he fled through the deserts until he reached the distant lands of Midian. He wasn't followed. He was gone. He had disappeared. And the slavery continues for decades. In Midian... Moshe actually meets a beautiful woman and chooses to marry her. She is the daughter of Jethro, Yisroi, 
who pops up later on in the book of Exodus. And he works for Yisro. Moshe loves the life. Yisro is a great father-in-law. He's a fantastically spiritual individual. His daughter, Moshe's wife, also spiritual girl. They have the common beliefs. They have children. And he's just working for his father-in-law as a shepherd, looking after the sheep with no intention of ever returning until one day. One day, one sheep goes stray and Moshe chases it, follows it, and he becomes separated from the rest of the sheep, trying to save this little sheep. And as it moves through a ravine, he stumbles upon the burning bush. And he looks at the burning bush, and that's not strange. He's in a desert. But what is strange is that the bush is not being consumed by the fire. And it's this time that Moshe has his first experience speaking with Hashem. And from within the bush, he hears the voice that tells him to remove his shoes because the land he stands on is holy. And then the instruction to go back to Egypt and save the people by delivering the message to Pharaoh to let my people go. Moshe's a bit hesitant and doesn't want to. And there seems to have been a bit of a, a demand made of him. Moshe doesn't want to go because he's got a speech impediment. He, he finds it challenging to speak. And he, what sort of leader could he be? He can't speak well. He's forgotten Egyptian. His lisp is shocking. And we'll talk about the lisp and his language maybe tomorrow. And he goes, goodbye, Yisro. Goodbye, family. I've got a mission. As he approaches Egypt, his brother Aaron greets him. Aaron seems to have received a prophetic message to meet Moses. And the two of them make an appointment. And of course, because this is Moses returning very quickly, he has an appointment with Pharaoh. And he makes this simple demand that God has sent me to tell you to let his people go. And Pharaoh laughs. He says, come now. I don't know which God you're talking about. I know many gods. I myself am a god, says Pharaoh. And there is no God for the slaves. I've never heard of this God that you speak of, the creator. Don't know him. No, don't acknowledge his existence. And therefore, I'm not going to listen. And Moshe says, if not, if not, we are going to bring the first plague, the plague of blood, to which Pharaoh laughs. Now, the reason why Pharaoh laughs is because there had been a couple demonstrations before this, which I haven't got time to go into now, of where Moses demonstrates to Pharaoh the miracles of God by turning his staff into a snake and then the snake consuming the staffs of the, other, of the other magicians. Because Pharaoh had instructed his magicians to match Moshe's miracles. Moses' staff turned into a snake. The magicians turned their staff into a snake. And the fact that his snake ate their sticks or that his stick ate their snakes doesn't seem to bother, him, bother Pharaoh too much. And when the first plague comes... And it wasn't actually Moses, but Aaron who would take Moses' staff and strike the Nile River and it would turn to blood. And we'll talk about that. Why did Aaron have to do it and not Moses? Pharaoh isn't too bothered. Of course, he's upset that there is no drinking water in Egypt. But when his magicians prove to him that they too can turn water from one substance into another, he says, well, power-wise, we're equal. And for an extended period of days, there is no drinking water available for the Egyptians. But the commentaries tell us the Jews did have water. And if two people, an Egyptian and a Jew, would be drinking from the same jug of water, it would pour blood into the Egyptian's cup and water into the Jewish cup. This was a clear demarcation of who was the victim and who was now being protected, and who was the aggressor who was now being prosecuted. And now the series of plagues. Pharaoh keeps saying no, Moses keeps going back, and the, and the Torah keeps telling us that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Hardened Pharaoh's heart, as in removed his free choice? What's that all about? Tomorrow, the day after. How could God remove a person's choice and then punish him for making the wrong choice? Doesn't sound very, very fair. But frogs, lice, wild animals, sickness, locusts, hail, boils, not going in order, darkness, 
eventually, after nine plagues, Moses comes back and says, Pharaoh, come now. You've seen the power of God. You've got to let the people go. And Pharaoh says, okay, you can go, your children can go, but you've got to leave the cattle behind. And, and he's always been haggling with Moshe, like he can't just let the slaves go. And Moshe says, we're all going. And Pharaoh says, you know what? No one's going. If that's how demanding and persistent you're going to be, I'm not letting anyone go. And Moshe says, then at approximately midnight tonight, and this is months and months and months after the first plague, at approximately midnight tonight, and why approximate and not specifically midnight later on in the series, at approximately midnight, the angel of death, God will come through Egypt and empower the angel of death to kill every firstborn male. And although this sends a shudder through Pharaoh because he himself is a firstborn male, he says, I don't care. Bring it on. Moses says, this is the last time I will ever come to your palace. And it's true, because after this, Pharaoh seeks Moses out. Moses goes back to the Jewish camp and has over time proven himself because initially they were not too excited because after the first plagues, their workload went skyrocketing. When they thought life couldn't get any worse, it got way worse. But over time, they had warmed up to Moses because the work had got less and they were watching how the Egyptians actually were being punished and life was getting easier for them. And Moses said, people, tonight, pack up. Everyone must bring a, uh, make a sacrifice of a sheep, take its blood and put it on the doorpost. And as the angel of death passes through Egypt, it will pass over the homes with the blood on the door. If you don't have it, it will come and it will seek the firstborn son because the angel of death just does as it's told. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just doing its thing. Kill the firstborn males in Egypt. It doesn't know how to differentiate between one soul and another in this instance. And so the Jews are given their night to pack up and they do. They do their sacrifice. They pack up. They stay indoors. And as the wailing through Egypt spreads, Pharaoh comes demanding Moses, where are you? I must speak with you. And comes to the Jewish camp and says, get out. And Moses says, nah, we're not thieves in the night. We'll leave in the morning. We'll leave late morning, in fact, when everyone's ready to go. We can't just pack up and go. We've got to pack. We don't want to look like criminals who are escaping prison or something. We're going free. And Pharaoh begs, and that's Moses' last word. As day breaks, the people finish packing, and they begin moving with their matzos, because they haven't got time to bake bread. They're moving. In one night, they've packed up their lives. They've taken assets. In fact, they've even demanded payment from the Egyptians, from which some of them took assets from. But we'll have to talk about that another time, how Alexander the Great settled one of the most famous lawsuits between the Jews and the Egyptians many, many hundreds of years later. A thousand years later. They begin leaving. And as they start approaching the Red Sea... Pharaoh realizes what's going on. Approximately 1.5 to 1.8 million people are taking their leave. See you, mate. We're out. How would this look in history? The Pharaoh that lost the slave nation of over a million people. Which is why it's not in the hieroglyphics, because hieroglyphics are usually very positive. You don't read hieroglyphics about failures of the pharaohs. Hieroglyphics were, were written and commissioned and drawn to promote a pharaoh. And no pharaoh is going to say, oh, and one of my big things was I let 1.5 million slaves leave on my watch. We didn't do a thing. And pharaoh gives the instruction for the army to massacre the people, chase them down. And the army are set up and begin chasing the Jewish ex-slaves. And as the Jews approach the sea, they notice they're being sandwiched between the sea and the army. And the Jews quickly break into four different groups, not to fight. One group says, we'll fight. Another group says, let's go back. Let's go back and be slaves. We don't want to be slaughtered like this. What, are there not enough graves in Egypt that we need to be massacred by the sea? And they're absolutely frightened. And other groups start praying, oh God, save us, save us. And it's only when Nachshon, one heroic man says, enough with the crying, I'm going. And he plunges into the sea and he marches through. And when the water reaches his nose, the sea splits. A person who wants a miracle, as we're going to explore, has to initiate. 
create a keli, create a vessel, so that a miracle can flow. But we'll talk about that maybe in day three or four of this series. And as the sea splits and the sand, which the sea was lying on, becomes dry, the people charge and they march through. And as the army approaches, the people move quickly. And the army actually approaches the sea and the sea is still split. And as the last ones move along, the army charges in with their horses, with their chariots, with Pharaoh in the, in the, at the head. And the sand becomes moist and it becomes soggy and it slows down the chariots and it slows down the army. And as the Jewish people keep moving, the sea starts collapsing. The walls start collapsing on the people and the soldiers and the army drown. And what happens to Pharaoh is actually an interesting Talmudic discussion as to whether he ever survived or not. But that's not for today. Maybe later. The Jewish people come out on the other side and on the 14th day of Nisan, they're there, looking at the ocean, watching all sorts of military hardware be washed ashore. Egypt is on the other side, and they're now free. An 80-something year intense slavery has come to an end, just like that, with a series of miracles, an open display of, 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 of God's power. And Moses announces, we're going to the promised land. We're going to Israel. We're going home. And the people begin walking. And he says, but before we go, we're going to make one stop at Mount Sinai. We're going to receive the Ten Commandments. We're going to receive the law of which we are going to live by, a constitution for the people. But with that, we will also receive the spiritual meaning of why we exist. And with that, we can build a nation and a homeland. And that's the story of Pesach, the story of how we became slaves and how we became free. Tomorrow, I'm going to run through different parts of the story, and we're going to look for the deepest spiritual meaning of, there are a number of things I said we'll talk about later, and we will. What are the deeper meanings? What are the subtleties and the nuances in this story? What does it mean for me? How in, in the modern era am I meant to learn? And where is the personal growth message within the story? So I'll be using the next couple of days to Kabbalistically explain some of the incidents in the story and then the practical Hasidic teachings that come from, that, from these Kabbalistic teachings of how this means a betterment of self, a betterment of society and an enrichment of life. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a great day.